Hi, I'm Andrew Tsao. In this episode of Backstory, we're going to see a trailer for Walk Right In, a film that tells the story of the Yale Summer High School during a time of great national upheaval in which a small group of educators redefined the enterprise. Drawing on the great books of Western literature, they tackled sensitive issues of race, tolerance, and personal identity as they searched for a sense of common purpose, which at that time eluded the nation. Through first-hand accounts and following students from their moment of selection to the culmination of the program to where they are today, this film is a compelling reminder of the importance of inclusive and effective education and its impact across the generations. With us today is the filmmaker, Larry Paris. Larry, welcome to Backstory. Thank you so much for coming by, Larry. My pleasure, Andrew. So this period of history was unique in many ways for America, and we're going to let you talk a little bit about that. But the, 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 the moment in time that the Yale High School happens, I mean, it, it couldn't have been a more volatile period. And so tell us how you personally got involved in the story. Well, this was 1967, 68, 1967. Uh, I just left the New Haven school system. Uh, had been a minor cause celeb there in terms of the teaching of Vietnam in the public schools uh -huh. and was sort of the center of a lot of controversy at that time. And uh, left looking for a new kind of opportunity, uh, something of a challenging nature, especially interested in terms of alternative education and new ways of educating students. And the times were a bubbling at that time, lots of stuff blowing in the wind. Um, 1967 was my first year with this poverty program, and 1968, uh, the year that changed the world, yeah. uh, and essentially was impacted by the course of events and the decision made to integrate that course of events into the curriculum uh, because they were trying directly affecting and touching on everybody's well, personal what, what, lives. What made you the right person? I mean, you're in New Haven. You already, as you're, you're pointing out, had a bit of a controversial position in the community, and now you end up at, the, at, at Yale with this summer program. Yeah. I, I guess the, the, everybody was impacted by these events. Uh, uh, I especially had taken a, a major uh, position in, in terms of uh, projecting the need for tackling controversial issues okay. in the New Haven area. Okay. I previously run a program called Perspectives that dealt with controversial issues on Saturday mornings for high school students throughout the New Haven area. I had a fairly heightened social and political consciousness at that time. I uh, was especially indignant over the course of events in Vietnam mm -hmm. and the like and felt that not only were they impacting on the nation, they were impacting on people's individual lives sure. as well. Uh, and so took this program that was essentially geared to just helping poverty kids get into college and determined that this was going to be a model for a different way of education, a different way of thinking about schooling and education, mm -hmm. and the extent to which the, what was happening in the outside world and what was happening in the inner world of the students themselves would converge, would have that opportunity to converge by the kind of curriculum and the kind of program that we designed. Um, and again, just to pl put it in proper historical context, n I, as I said, 68 really changed the world. Yeah. It was an incredible year. Uh, and for those who don't remember... Uh, well, we have the death of Robert Kennedy, the death of Martin Luther King, we have the Tet Offensive, we have Nixon entering the White House, we've got protests everywhere on campuses, right? So in the middle of this, the Yale Summer High School takes place. Yeah, and uh, so the country is really falling apart, this seems, rioting in all the major cities in the United States, race relations really uh, at, the, at their severest. Mm -hmm. uh, and the issue was, could we create a curriculum and a course of study that would address those issues, not just because they were worthy of being addressed, addressed, but also because they really affected the kids and their lives. Uh, and they were very personal issues. These were not just merely abstract political issues. And so we developed and designed a new curriculum. Okay. And we brought together this incredible student body. I mean, we're, we're talking about 150 students mm -hmm. from all over the country that represented a microcosm of what this country was really all about. Right. And, um, and you had... You had kids from an incredibly diverse background. Some we were talking before the show, and you're saying you had you had uh, Caucasian kids from areas who'd really never been with a black uh, kid before, and vice versa. Right. I mean, I, I, again, you know, the uh, this country was really uh, segments of the country were really insulated, isolated from one another, and and black kids from the rural South, incredibly different uh, breed of 
person than, say, the black kids from Bedford-Stuyvesant in Harlem. Just a whole different way of being in the world, thinking about the world, dealing with race, etc. White kids from Vermont, New Hampshire, as I said to you earlier, never seen a black kid in their life, uh, uh, used to really operating essentially in all white communities. Uh, uh, Native American kids from, who have been isolated on reservations, such as in Rosebud, North Dakota, uh, or Latino kids from California in the Southwest. And none of these kids had ever interacted with anybody outside of their immediate grouping. Mm -hmm. And we created this school, which was also a laboratory in the sense that for the white kids, it was extraordinary because they were outnumbered by kids of color mm -hmm. on the campus. And for kids of color, they were outnumbered. Uh, they, were, they, they were in the majority for the first time, mm -hmm. but they were not in a major majority, okay? Uh, uh, there was a balance there in the school. And so all of them had to figure out how to learn to live and be with one another in some way. And, and the program itself, they're not only learning, but they're learning how to learn, and you are watching them learn in new ways and how to teach in new ways. Right, and I, I guess probably the most radical concept of all is that the school itself and the people in the school and their interactions with one another uh, is a major source of the learning experience itself. It isn't just the classroom, it isn't just the curriculum. Yeah. We are the curriculum, the school, the students in it, how they interact with one another, how they live with one another. That is a major rich source of learning in itself. Uh, as McLuhan used to say, the medium is the message right. and, and the school itself is the message, yeah. how it's constituted and how it operates. So you decide to make this film and we're talking about an event in 68 but you're making the film and people will see when they view it that you're actually revisiting these people from the Yale Summer School in their, as you said before, they're now in their 60s. You go about making this film, but I assume the research, the archival work, the recreation work, I mean, this is a mountain of material. What, what, what idea or, or uh, premise did you go on as the filmmaker to go, this is how I'm gonna tell the story? Well, you know, there are different ways that one can approach a, a work of art. Uh, one can start off with really clearly defined goals uh, and sort of almost like a one A, B, C, D mm -hmm. predisposition. Or one can say, I have a sense of what it is I want to do. I have the spirit of it. I can feel it in my heart and my soul. And, and this was very much a, a, a project of the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a series of love letters to the people that I worked with more than 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it was sort of, let's go and let's see what happens. Okay. Uh, and, and sort of like standing at the, at the foot of a chasm and deciding to jump. You close your eyes and you jump. Um, you realize you can't do it in two steps. Right. You just have to make that one existential leap and you want, are willing to be surprised as to what will happen. So you make this leap and you come back to, I'm going to presume you, you edited the film here in Seattle. Yeah, I mean. And you come back with, I think you said, almost 100 hours yeah. of material. Now the shaping process begins. Yeah. You can't just jump into that without an idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, w what happened was that, uh, um, I think I said to you, this is one of the prerogatives of old age, is that I was, I guess, 74, 75 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, decided I wanted to do the film. Uh, and without any preconceptions of what it was I wanted to do, all I knew was that I wanted to do it. All I know is that what happened in 1968 had a significant impact on my thinking, on my life. I was deeply touched by the people there. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen these people since they were 16 years of age. And here I was, I was about to visit them again. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at, you know, and they were now not longer 16. They were 60, yeah. 61, 62 years old. Um, and basically got a videographer, uh, made four trips around the country, um, just shot like crazy, yeah. um, had a series of predetermined questions that I asked of everybody uh, in the Rashomon style, sort of knowing that each person had a different perspective on what actually had occurred at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, and as you said, came back essentially with a hundred hours yeah. or so of, of tape and just like, what do I do now kind mm -hmm. of thing. And uh, at that point, uh, I was very fortunate. Um, uh, at my desperation uh, uh, got hold of Jerry Large at the Seattle Times. He was kind enough to write a great column about me looking for help on the film. Uh, I got help uh, immediately. 
um, uh, Marth Christensen and his son-in-law, Eric McGrath, who, who came on uh, uh, from their horror film backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, just incredibly. And you found your editor. I found my editor, Amy Enser, who became also co-director, who was integral to doing the film. You know, I, I got to say, that's got to be one of the pluses of the Seattle film community, this idea that you know, Jerry can write a piece and people come out and they put their hearts and, yeah. and souls into it. And then I just want to point out to the viewers that one of the things they're going to get to see that you did get was the first time in how many years now that the original Yale summer school people get back together. And it's really a, a, an amazing yeah. moment. Yeah, we, we capped, we did the film and then uh, we decided we wanted to do a reunion yeah. uh, of everybody too. and so. Even though people had been interviewed individually, they never had the chance collectively to gather together again. Mm -hmm. And so we essentially contacted the people at the Yale Divinity School, and we set up a reunion. We did uh, videotaping at the reunion. We integrated that into the film itself, uh, and people could. S so we've got really a great interplay of of, of shots. We've got pictures of these kids when they were 16, 17 years right, of age. Right. Uh, we had a great photographer named Ralph Ferrucci who just did ma magnificent still photos of these kids on mm -hmm. campus back in 1968. We've got you know the contemporary shots of them, we've got the shots of them growing up. Um, and, and so even though this is not an action film per se. It's it, got a lot of material that's really unique and that time perspective is absolutely yeah. fantastic. Now, here's a look at the trailer for Walk Right In. In 1968, we were in the middle of the Vietnam War. We were in the middle of both the civil rights movement and chaos in the cities. And in the midst of all this, the Yale Summer High School is assembling to talk about the human condition and about race and about who they are. When Larry Paris came on as director in 1967, the situation in the country had changed considerably, and we were mutually committed to designing an educational program that would address the issues of these kids and allow them to grapple with them. It must have just occurred to us, why not put together the literature of the great books and the problem of race in America and come up with a curriculum that really addresses what's going on in the world around us. Even in 1968, race, for the most part, still was a taboo subject. You get in a mixed company and you don't talk about it. I kind of identified with the blacks to a large degree. Poverty and no hope. I'm sure they saw me as just a Midwestern dork, you know, but I didn't care as long as they didn't think that, uh, that I was racist or anything. As Larry Paris found out, if you try to deal with the really hot issues of the day that touch people most deeply, people get excited. And that particular kind of excitement isn't welcome in most schools. The critique of the Yale Summer High School was that it was messy, that it was kind of anarchic in style, and that didn't fit this very narrow mission, which was to produce 1,000 male leaders a year. If you questioned that definition of leadership, or you perceive yourself outside of that in some way, that wasn't what the Yale administration really wanted. The energy of the Summer High School in 68 was no way in the world like that of other schools. It was all over the place. There was a hot environment for me intellectually. I, I mean, I didn't even know I had intellect at the time. See, my classroom experience, the last thing in the world I would be thinking about when I went home was what information I had gotten at school that day. So that was the first time that I can remember ever really enjoying learning. Larry, the uh, film gets at a subject which today we're facing it, uh, in higher ed, which is these concepts of disruption. Uh, you hear phrases like flipping the classroom, um, that the model is broken. You were involved with higher ed and, and the bringing of young people to it long before these phrases became catchphrases. Can you just give us some of your take on the current state of higher ed and, and what you think needs to happen in order to make it more accessible and uh, uh, something that people, all people can aspire to. 
Well, it isn't just higher ed, it's uh, education in general in the United States. And uh, I guess a single word uh, would be describing it would be a mess. Um, uh, people have really not thought clearly at all about education. Um, it, we're sort of running off in all directions all at the same time. Uh, the larger questions are, are not seem to be addressed at this time. Questions uh, towards what end, for what purpose, why are we doing this? Um, everybody's busy running around trying to put their fingers in the holes in the dike mm. because it's clear there are d incredible difficulties in terms of both higher and l lower education today. But uh, everybody's in the, being in this state of panic and trying to look for short-term uh, solutions mm -hmm. uh, don't realize that the longer term issues have to first be addressed. And of course the film Walk Where I Didn't asks one of the biggest questions, who is it for? Yeah. Because the film talks about how bringing these people together from disparate backgrounds changes fundamentally their view of what education is. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, you know, the, the, this incredible disparity of wealth and power in this mm -hmm. country today is being reflected all too accurately in terms of access to higher education. In a sense, things were better back in the 60s than they are today. Uh, in what sense? In the sense that fewer- Access? Ac access, I mean, you know, if you're cost, a poor- Just cost, strict cost, if or? You're, if you're a poor kid, a yeah. kid of color, trying to access higher education today, your, your, your choices, your options are really incredibly limited. I mean, the costs of higher education have soared through the roof, mm -hmm. and this notion of, of, of just giving higher scholarship aid to students just doesn't really cut it. You're talking about this concept that is being advanced now that we are facing as well here in Washington State, which is the high tuition, high aid model. Right, and even if, even if you do receive uh, aid, Look what remains. My grandson, for example, has been accepted at American University in Washington, D.C. Okay. Um, the cost there are about $45,000 a year. Well, he's gotten an $18,000 merit scholarship. Mm -hmm. Well, that's wonderful, $18,000. But who's going to pick up the remaining tab? Mm -hmm. How is he going to do this? Mm -hmm. If you're a student of color, if you come from an underprivileged background, how do you make do? Mm -hmm. uh, student loans. So you're going to be saddled with student loans for the rest of your life. This mm -hmm. is an incredible problem, not only personally for students, but nationally that we're going to be facing down the road. Well, you know, and that gets to the pressures on higher ed about what is being taught. And in, in Walk Right In, you're talking about bringing high school kids to a university setting, and you're also talking about tough subjects here. You're not just teaching them accounting or mathematics. Yeah. I mean, the, those things go without saying. You're dealing with an area that, you know, even today as we speak right now, highly controversial stuff. Should it even be taught? Shouldn't yeah. universities just be a place where you get a, a, a job training right. uh, degree and get out there? And should the, should the human beings evolution in this factor at all? Yeah, this is really a serious issue. Uh, uh, our universities, our, our not only our colleges, but also our high schools, are going to be nothing more than really trade schools of sorts. Whatever happened to the concept of a liberal arts education? Mm. Whatever happened to questions about human values, the values that inform our actions? Whatever happened, where does philosophy, where do the arts really figure into the scheme of things? Mm. Are these merely uh, uh, stops on the way to a trade, mm. or are they something more profound that really shine lights on various aspects of the human condition, who we are as human beings? If we want better human beings, we want more sensitive, caring, loving, compassionate beings, do we want a more loving, sensitive, compassionate, caring society, then our education has to reflect that as well. And we have to see our educational system as something more than just a utilitarian function. You know, it's ironic because as an educator myself, I, I read a lot of data on this and we consistently get reports from CEOs and people who hire across the country that they, they by a vast majority, up to 90% say, look, I don't care what the kid's degree is. I want to know that they're a critical thinker, that they have empathy for other human beings, that they can problem solve, and they're creative. And that's yeah, the irony yeah. is that there's a lot of pressure sure. to say, no, just train the kid in a trade, but yet people out there saying, give me a whole human being. Yeah, and the people who are most successful in today's world, okay, are not people with a high academic IQ, but people who have a high emotional IQ. And we found that people who really understand themselves better, but are able to relate to themselves, to the world around them, to other human beings, also are the ones who are actually most successful. Mm -hmm. It isn't a matter of just uh, building a better mousetrap. Yeah. Let's shift over to yourself now as a filmmaker. Before we shot the show, you and I had a chance to talk about a couple of other 
subject you've dealt with. I was particularly interested in your own personal journey to, in your family's history uh, about your grandmother. After making this film now, let's talk about Larry Peros, the <laughs> filmmaker, and what's coming yeah. up and what's happening for you. Yeah, I don't know about Larry Peros, the filmmaker. Okay. Um, uh, I know something about Larry Paris. Uh, I, I always have a difficult uh, task trying to attach myself to a particular role. Uh, and I like to think that I'm greater than the various roles that I play. Okay. So uh, uh, it sounds nice. That has a nice ring to yeah. it, Larry Paris, the <laughs> filmmaker. Um, essentially, I follow my heart. I do the things that mean most to me, that are most important to me. I did the film primarily because I wanted to recognize, I really wanted to pay honor yeah. to something very special that occurred, and also because I felt it would shine a light on a, on a darker area of educational reform where mm -hmm. people really don't understand what that process entails. Um, I wanted them to see what happens to people who undergo a particular educational approach, what happens to them years later. Yes. You know, we like to talk about education having an impact on people, and it was really incredible experience to see them at age 16 hear about the program that they encountered, mm -hmm. and then to look at them 40 years later, 50 years later, what ha what impact did that have yeah. on their life? Well, on and their as thinking? we saw in the film, it had a profound impact. I mean, yeah. the, the, they were fundamentally changed as human beings. But see, for me, you know, again, that was what impelled me to get into film. Also, okay. I have a love of film. Yeah. Uh, I love film. I, I'm just a film junkie. Uh, uh, and I had done a film earlier uh, called The Journey based on my mother's uh, uh, trip to the United States, right. uh, coming here as an immigrant from, from the Ukraine, from a small town outside of Odessa near the Black Sea. Uh, and it was a good training ground in a sense right. that I learned about filmmaking. But I also, just having watched hundreds and hundreds of films yeah. in my lifetime and being a film junkie, yeah. uh, I essentially had an intuitive sense about filmmaking, even though I had never taken a formal course in, in doing so. So I guess I, f I feel I'm a filmmaker as I am sort of an educator and as I am also a writer. I am all those things and none of those things. Um, I'd love to continue doing some work in filmmaking. I'm working on an animated film now, uh, simply because animation intrigues me. Well, that was what I was gonna ask. I was, <laughs> I was gonna put you on the spot and say, okay, Larry, given all that, I say, I walk in the door and I say, Larry, I wanna commission you to do a, a film right now. Tell me what it is. Yeah. But uh, this one, again, came out of left field. Okay. Uh, it came out of other work that I'm doing, which is etymology. I'm interested in words, word origins, phrases, and the extent to which they, shine a, they, they convey a sense of who we are as human beings. The words we use, how we express ourselves, tell us something about ourselves. And so, uh, again, this is sort of a, a strange digression from education, but I'm interested in sexual language, mm. how we express ourselves sexually, the words, the expressions we use. And I've created an animated film, essentially animating our use of language in terms of how we approach sexuality. Mm. Uh, it's just something that intrigues me about human nature, about the human condition. It's something that I feel needs to be done and also appeals to the comic in me because I enjoy having a good time. And I think people should be able to approach the subject of sexuality mm. with some degree of dignity uh, that could be done in, in an exquisite fashion, not in a gross fashion, mm -hmm. um, uh, not to be frightened by it. I give people permission mm -hmm. to talk and think about something they ordinarily can't express. And, to, and so that appeals to me. So that's a project, but uh, the, the major project, once that is concluded, I, uh, um, uh, I'll be turning 80 in February, is, is I promised myself I would do the work on education, the book on education. Great. And, the Yale Summer High School film will be a part of that. Absolutely. But what I hope to do is to integrate the experience of the 60s, the experience of the 70s when I was involved in alternative education and creating alternative schools out of old bowling alleys and working with the community and working with poverty kids in that context with the technology today. Uh, right. And how do we blend those three dimensions together in creating a more humane and more responsive educational system for all children? Fantastic. Well. We wish you best of luck, and we look forward to having you back here again because these sound like fascinating projects. Larry, thank you Great. so much for being here on Backstory, and thank you for watching Backstory. I'm Andrew Tsao, and I will see you again behind the scenes. Awesome.